Hello, Vision Nation. In this episode, we're going to cover Naval Ravikant's story. If you've never heard of him before, Naval is a venture capitalist out in Silicon Valley. He invested in companies like Twitter and Uber way before they were household names. Now, investing in those companies is cool, but what's even more interesting to me is that he made a fortune using something called the four types of leverage. I've thought about this concept a lot since I first learned about it, and I want to share it with you because I think you'll also find it useful. The four types of leverage are labor, capital, code, and media. And in this episode, we'll take a closer look at them and why they're so powerful. We'll also cover the story of how Naval started off with nothing and became very wealthy. Welcome to Wall Street Vision Investing Podcast. This show is on true stories about markets and top investors. I'm Vlad Dolgochev. This show is for informational purposes only and is not investment advice. Check out the show notes for the full disclaimer. So Naval was nine when his family immigrated from India to New York City. This was the 80s, and New York was still a gritty place at that point. They settled in the seedy neighborhood in Queens. His father worked as a pharmacist in India, but couldn't get a job in the U.S., so the dad worked at a hardware store instead. He took a huge pay cut going from selling pills to selling pliers. It's hard to make it through as a family when you're broke in a new country and your kids are eating 20-cent ramen noodles for dinner. The parents eventually separated. Mom wasn't around much because she worked long hours and took night classes. Instead of hanging out on the streets, Naval's after-school program was going to the library. It's never easy for an immigrant kid to get accepted into a new culture, so instead of socializing with other kids, he'd read books. It was a way of opening up his mind. He was seeing what could be possible for his future. To make a few extra dollars, he'd deliver newspapers and scrub dishes in a cafeteria. His first job was at a catering company that delivered Indian food from the back of a truck. And early on, he was a so-so student, and it looked like his future might be delivering curry platters for the rest of his life. But then, he got his first big break when he went into Stuyvesant High School. He couldn't afford a private school, but Stuyvesant was the same quality as getting a private education and it was public, which meant that it was free for any kid that passed their entrance exam. This is the type of place that kids actually want to go to because it gives them hope for a better future. When it's a cold winter and you have a coat on in your living room to save money on heating bills, hope is exactly what you need to get you through that. If it wasn't for that high school, maybe he would have gotten lost in the shuffle. That education helped him go from blue collar to white collar in a single move. That's some 3D chess right there. And it also shows the importance of being part of the right network. Making it in there was social proof that told people, Naval has the right stuff to be an achiever. I guess that's why parents are so focused on getting their kids into Ivy League schools. They're obsessed to the point that some parents are even willing to go to jail for it. Just look at the admission scandal. These people were willing to put on an orange jumpsuit for Timmy to get into Harvard. Crazy stuff. Now, since Naval went to the library and read so much, he developed this depth of knowledge about a whole range of different topics. This helped him come up with a framework for using leverage to become rich. It was a blueprint that he followed for the next four decades of his life. How cool is that? For a teenage kid to come up with an idea that he used to guide his choices for decades afterwards. 
That's amazing. Before we get to the rest of the story, let's take a moment to discuss this leverage concept because it's something so powerful. All right, so leverage is when you're able to put in a little bit of effort and get a lot of output in return. Now we're all familiar with mechanical leverage, right? Using a car jack is an example of mechanical leverage. You can't lift your car with your bare hands, but you can lift a car using this tool that requires very little physical strength. So there are mechanical forms of leverage, and there's other forms of leverage that you can use in career life or business. I'm going to go over them because they're so important to the story, and knowing about these principles and applying them is what made Naval into a multi-millionaire. And the thing is, if you understand these forms of leverage and apply them in your own life, they can make a huge difference for you as well. The first type of leverage is labor. It's also the oldest form of leverage. This is when you hire someone to do work for you. Naval worked at a catering company, right? The owner of the company hired cooks, drivers, and delivery people to help run her business. There's no way that the owner could serve 300 meals a day by herself. If she tried to do that, she'd blow a gasket. But she could serve more than 300 meals a day with the help of all these employees. Labor is messy because it requires good leadership and it's hard managing a big group of people. Humans are complicated. So this type of leverage has ongoing issues that need to be carefully managed. Being the CEO sounds cool on paper, but there's always a negative Nancy or a downer Dan complaining about something and stirring the pot. So keeping the ship sailing smoothly is not easy. The second form of leverage is capital, which is basically just money. You know how some people say it takes money to make money? Well, that's true in some ways, and so many fortunes were created by using capital. Take Warren Buffett, for example. He took capital, invested it well, and made a killing. Do you know how many people work in the head office of Warren Buffett's company? 30 people, that's it. That tiny head office controls all the companies they own. So that small office of 30 people has a staff of 360,000 people working for them. But Warren Buffett doesn't really manage people, per se. He manages capital. And he always focused on hiring other great leaders so that he wouldn't have to get involved with the day-to-day -day decisions. This guy doesn't want to lead town halls for 300,000 people. He wants to figure out what businesses to invest in. The third form of leverage is code. Code is software, and it's super powerful because a small team can write a piece of software, and then that software can be used by millions of people. The value that a great piece of software can create is huge. Here's an example. Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin, right? Okay, so maybe Satoshi was a team of people working together. Nobody really knows for sure. But let's just say that it was 10 people working together to make this code that powered Bitcoin. And the value of all the Bitcoin is now worth over $700 billion. How crazy is it that a group of 10 people created something that is worth $700 billion? That's as much as Warren Buffett's company is worth today. And all that value was created by a small handful of people. Here's another example. A team of engineers created Facebook, and there are almost 3 billion people that use Facebook today. Small teams can create huge value through the right piece of software. Media is the fourth and last type of leverage. This is anything that can be created and consumed by a big crowd. A song, movie, book, blog, video, or article are all forms of media. 
once you write an article, it can be read by 10 people or a million people, and that's not going to take any more effort from you as the creator. Mr. Beast is a YouTuber who's 23 years old. Between all his platforms, he has around 200 million subscribers. Way more people watch his content than CNN, for example. That's leverage on steroids. So leverage is this thing that allows for a small input to turn into a huge output. And to recap, you've got labor, capital, code, and media as different types of leverage. All right, back to the story. While studying Naval's career, I noticed that he looked for opportunities where he could use leverage to his advantage. I think his plan was to make the biggest possible impact. And leverage is the best way to do that. Going to that top high school made it possible to transition to an Ivy League college. That's how he got into Dartmouth. Now, Dartmouth is a top college in the States, and they only accept like 9% of their applicants. So getting into the right high school and the right college made Naval look like an achiever off the bat. He studied computer science and economics in college. He wanted to be a scientist, but he also didn't want to be working at a lab somewhere out in the boonies for 20 bucks an hour. So he saw the intersection of science and money as being tech. Tech was also a great place to apply the leverage philosophy that he developed earlier in his life. While in college, he went all in on the computer science classes. He even got a government loan to buy a Mac classic computer. In today's money, he paid 8,000 bucks for that little nine inch screen and it took him 10 years to pay off that loan. Naval knew that there was a huge upside to being in tech, and this loan to buy the computer was a small price to pay to get better at programming. The upside was massive because it would allow him to use the leverage framework that we talked about. After getting his degree, he went on to Silicon Valley he worked a few 9 to 5 jobs, but wanted to do something different. He knew that he wasn't going to get massive success by working for somebody else. So he launched this company called ePinions in 1999. It was a website where people could post questions, opinions and reviews. Kind of like a Yelp or a Quora. It was a tech company that used code and their small team of developers could service tons of users. A small input could provide huge value, like the Bitcoin example we talked about. Naval was 25 years old, and he was finally part of something that could be really big. This was all about using code to create leverage. Then, the dot-com bubble burst, and a bunch of tech companies got wiped out. But amazingly, Epinions survived. Now here's the crazy thing. By then, Naval and the three other co-founders had already left the company. But together, they still owned 6 million shares of stock. The new owners of the company had this proposal to merge Epinions with another firm. Naval and the other co-founders had enough shares to shut down this proposed merger. But they actually agreed for it to go through. This meant that all their 6 million shares would become worthless. Seems like a pretty generous thing to do, right? Well, it's not like it was charity. Because Naval believed that ePinions was worth a maximum of 38 million at the time. And the two venture capital funds that were also invested in the company had a claim on 45 million of equity. Essentially, that meant that the stock Naval and the other co-founders owned wasn't really worth anything. Well, here's where it gets fishy. Naval and the other co-founders didn't know about the secret deal that Epinion signed with Google. 
the deal would increase the company's revenues by 14x, which is an insane boost. The new management at ePinions kept this deal hush-hush. And then soon after, the merged company went public at a value of 750 million. Naval and the other co-founders were shocked at this. So let's recap. Naval allowed the merger to happen, that wiped out all his shares, and that led to this IPO. And now here's the company going public for 750 million, and he's not getting a single cent. Now the co-founder that stayed with the company and the two venture capital funds that initially invested in it made a killing. They made around $160 million when the company went public. Naval and the other co-founders got zilch. They got nothing. Naval was pissed. This was a way for him to cash out, maybe buy his mom a nice house, and instead he's getting bamboozled. So his team launched a lawsuit. They alleged that ePinions hid information from them about that secret Google deal. They argued that if they knew about that deal, they would have never agreed to cancel out their shares. The stakes were high. Launching this lawsuit was a dangerous move. Silicon Valley is a super tight-knit group. Everyone knows everyone else. So your reputation plays a huge role in your career there. The two venture capital funds that he sued were big names in the valley, and they held a lot of power. For an entrepreneur to sue his investors was a big no-no. Naval got this nickname around that time. People were saying that he was, quote, radioactive mud. Nobody wanted to deal with him. It didn't matter that he might have had good grounds for that lawsuit. In the public eye, people just saw that he went against his investors. And that made it very hard for Naval to start another company. The good thing about the lawsuit was that it was settled for an undisclosed amount. And Naval got enough money to become an angel investor. Angel investors are people who invest in companies at the very beginning. Before venture capitalists get involved. So an angel investor might invest in a company that has no sales and is still working on their prototype. It's a huge risk for the investor, but if the company does well, the investor can make 100x or even 1000x their money in some cases. So Naval would go and invest small amounts between 10 and 50,000 into companies that were just starting out. He was providing capital, which is a form of leverage that we talked about earlier. He also created a blog called Venture Hacks. It was focused on helping entrepreneurs raise capital. He provided advice on stuff like negotiation skills, how venture capital works, how to pick a co-founder and stuff like that. There's leverage again, this time using media. His blog could be read by thousands of people. So it was an effective way to build back his reputation after it took a hit during the lawsuit. Since he was already providing value to entrepreneurs and venture capitalists with a blog, it was a natural transition to starting his next company. The company was called AngelList. AngelList was a way to connect investors with startups. Naval said, quote, AngelList is to investing what Tinder is to dating. It's funny because back then you could do all these different things online, but when it came time for entrepreneurs to fund their startup, they still had to meet people for tons of coffee pitches. Like these genius entrepreneurs were coming up with amazing ideas like Twitter and Uber, and in order to get funding for the businesses, they had to go to 20 different coffee chats. Isn't that silly? So AngelList could connect entrepreneurs to investors. 
Their goal was to open up venture capital and make it accessible to more people. They started with 50 angel investors willing to invest $80 million. And AngelList would make a profit by charging a 5% performance fee on the investments that succeeded. Now in the early days, there were some laws that closed their platform to the public. So at first, they would have the startups and a small handful of investors. In order to make it really grow, Naval had to roll up his sleeves and do some serious lobbying in Washington. This guy got a petition going and over 5,000 entrepreneurs and investors signed it. He spent six months doing serious lobbying. And he eventually succeeded. The law was changed. People in Silicon Valley were super happy about this popping champagne left and right because now a lot more people could help fund these startups. All this really helped to restore Naval's reputation. And it also allowed AngelList to deal with a much higher volume of potential investors. They quickly scaled to having investments of over 200 million per year. And this was a huge win for investors because now they had access to all of these early stage deals and it was a great win for entrepreneurs because now they could get more funding. It was a great win-win situation. Naval's hard work paid off. It was a catalyst that allowed him to invest in tons of great companies. All in all, Naval has been a seed or early investor in companies like Uber, Twitter, Opendoor, Poshmark, and like 200 other companies. Remember that leverage framework that we talked about? So now he was using capital to invest in software businesses, so he was doubling up on his leverage. In a Wall Street Journal article from 2015, Naval said that he received around a penny from every Uber ride taken. I don't know if he's still a shareholder, and that might not be actual cash that he was receiving for each ride, but Uber has over a billion rides per quarter. So if that's still accurate, he'd be making 40 million plus per year just from that one investment. Even if he sold out of Uber a long time ago, a bunch of online sites have his net worth estimated at around $60 million which is a generational level of wealth. And how did he do it? By continuously using leverage. He used media, capital, and code to build up his career and financial success. All right, Vision Nation, that wraps it up for this week's episode. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the subscribe button leave a review, and if you know someone who's interested in investing, please share this episode with them. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have an amazing day. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. I may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast. This show is copyrighted by The Wall Street Vision. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.